Hello, my name is Dr. John Rafael. I'm a medical doctor, and in this video, I'm going to discuss Moderna's announcement earlier this morning of their vaccine candidate against the virus that causes COVID-19. All right, so this article was sent to me. It's being published by NPR, National Public Radio. It says, COVID-19 vaccine candidate heads to widespread testing in U.S. So what I like to do here is my goal is to go through the news and, um, I don't know, look at the points that they make and see if they're backed up scientifically going from the source from the research articles. Okay, so scrolling down here, it says COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine candidate. Uh, the company is called Moderna, which you've mentioned uh, partnering up here with this institute, uh, NIH. Before we continue, if you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe button below. Make sure to hit the bell to stay up to date on the latest COVID vaccine videos. Also, comment below. Let me know what other companies do you want to know about concerning the vaccine. And uh, they're on phase three. So phase three, just so you know, phase three, well, clinical trials go through four phases, okay? So I think here they mentioned it was the final phase or not here but another study someone said the final phase what well, what does that mean phase one which we're going to look at is uh they take like a small amount of participants let's say like less than 100 or something and they just test it out see what happens and they're testing out different dosages that's what we're going to look at today we're going to focus on their phase one study and what happened with that after phase one you go to phase two now you include a lot more people let's say a couple hundred people so in phase one you're testing on people that you'd say are normally healthy or they're not at risk for whatever the vaccine you're trying to make it for it. Phase two, now there's more people. Now there could be some people that are more at risk. So now you're getting a bigger idea of what that is. You've pretty much chosen a dosage level. So you've got that more down. Um, also the safety, the safety pro profile is a little bit better. And then phase three, that's like, okay, now we're gonna test it on thousands of people. In this case over here, we see how much are they gonna test it on. They're gonna test it on 30,000 volunteers, okay? These people are gonna be those who are anywhere, like any age group, any risk profile, any of that. So they're going to see how it goes. So after you usually pass phase, phase three and you're approved at that point, what happens is you go to phase four, which a lot of people don't talk about because it's already in the whole population, right? So after phase three, it's okay. Now everybody can go get it, but you continue to study it. That's actually phase four. All right. So let's go back here and see what happens. So what are we going to do with the 30,000 people? One group's going to get... Um, uh, we're going to divide them up, so 15,000 a group, right? So one group is going to get two injections. They're going to be spaced out 28 days apart, and they're going to get this vaccine. It's called mRNA1273. And obviously the other group is not. So, uh, it's a, called a control group, and they're going to get saline, also known as salt water. Okay, so neither the volunteer nor the person is going to know. Okay, what this basically saying is, okay, the people receiving uh, the vaccine or the salt water, they don't know which one they're getting. Uh, the people administering the vaccine too, whether it be doctors, nurses, whoever, they don't know what they're giving to the patient either. That's called a double blind study. That's supposed to rule out bias, okay? But obviously they hear, they say here, the people running the study obviously know, right? Because you label it. Let's say you label it number 215 and then number 216. So 216 is a vaccine, like, you know, whatever. Okay, so here they say organizers of the trial say there will have to only be approximately 150 cases of COVID among the study participants. So what's that saying is, okay, we're going to give it to 30,000 people, but really we're giving it to half of that, 15,000. Now that 15,000, if only 150 get the disease, then it's successful. Well, you know, that's pretty good because 150 divided by 15,000, that's only 1%. Now, I heard something, I think it was the CEO of Moderna, I'd have to double check uh, and go listen to the video, but I think he was told that if they were even 50%, so half of that 15,000, so 7,500, so even if half of them um, got the virus or the disease, I'm sorry, well, same thing, I guess, then, um, then it's successful. So that's some numbers I'd want to check into. Now they say how long it takes to reach that number and how many participants will have to be enrolled in the study. That's an open question. Obviously, um, you know, what's the time limit? What do we know? So it depends upon how much the virus is circulating the communities. It could take as much as 30,000 volunteers to get the answer. 
Okay, basically we're saying we need to go to a place where it's a hotbed, let's say the southern United States, which they're doing, right? And they gave the first vaccine earlier this morning in, um, I believe, Georgia. I think it was Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I think it was Emory University. You can double check that as well, too. So uh, then what? So according to a list maintained by World Health, uh, there are other four. There are four others in phase three. There's the Chinese. Uh, three of them are Chinese, and one of them is Oxford with AstraZeneca. So we'd have to look into more to see what they're up to. All right. So now they're saying, uh, what is the vaccine? The vaccine is uh, they take a piece of genetic cold code. Sorry, genetic code called mRNA. You probably heard of DNA. From DNA, you get RNA. From RNA, you get proteins, and then you start building the cell. Okay. So. I mentioned that because I saw an article uh, earlier, I actually got a screenshot of it here, um, I posted on my Facebook where CNN said uh, RNA were actually cells, but no, RNA, they are building blocks, they are molecules, and then they make cells. Uh, I went to it later today and they actually fixed it. So we always got to be careful where we're checking our sources, right? All right, and that's my goal. So, okay, so the RNA is going to make uh, proteins, you make the virus, so what's the point, important part of all this thing right here? All right, so you got a cell, right? And the cell is made up of, like, say, proteins and, and lipids and fats. And you guys all know that because everyone's dieting and trying to control all these things. Well, on the outside of the corona, you've probably seen the picture of this uh, virus before. Outside this coronavirus, there are spikes, like these little spike proteins that stick out. And uh, in cor corona, actually, um, not the drink, but corona, uh, when we're talking about what it is in Latin or Spanish, uh, it means a crown and that's why it's called coronavirus because there's these spikes coming off of it And that's why it's, yeah, it's a spike the spike virus you could call it and um, Each of these proteins are like name tags like if you have a name tag and it says, you know, hello, my name is John for example um, It identifies that cell to other cells in the body so The key is to find the proteins that are unique to that virus and to target them and to develop an immune response that attacks those cells that carry that protein marker on them. So what they're doing is they're taking this part, this RNA, like this, you know, the genetic map, let's say the fingerprints, and it's long and long and long and thousands and thousands of like parts to it. And what are they doing? They're taking a little snippet, a little piece of it, and they're saying, this is the one we're going to go after. This, this little code that makes this little protein, we're going to go after it because this is the part that allows the cell um, the virus to enter the cells okay so their idea here Moderna is say if we can stop the virus from entering into the cell then it can't go inside and replicate and increase the disease or even initiate it okay so that's the whole thing they're going into so what did I do is I went to Moderna's website so here it is it's modernatx.com so m-o-d-e-r-n-a-t-x.com and if you go up to their publications, you can take a look at what they have going on. You can see they have lots of other um, trials that they're doing. So if you look at the latest one over here, this is the mRNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. That's Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. That's the virus that causes the disease called COVID. COVID stands for Corona, C-O, virus, V-I, disease 19, because it was identified 2019. So when you go to it, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. We're going to get the data for their phase one trial. So you hit here, continue, and it takes you to the New England Journal of Medicine, and you can read it here. So what I decided to do was download it as a PDF and start to highlight points that I could discuss with you guys in the talk. Now, I, I went through it, spent a little bit of time. Um, there's lots of detail to it, but I figured I'd give you guys a basic idea. The abstract of the paper is basically just, you know, the summary of what's going on. They give you your background. Uh, okay, well, we basically know, uh, as I told you, this is the virus that causes COVID. The virus, can, the vaccine candidate, they're calling it mRNA-1273. That actually stands for messenger uh, RNA. And um, they're going after this uh, spike protein that I was talking about on the surface. So what did they do? This is their phase one. Okay, so the first... Uh, experiment clinical trial they took 45 adults and look at the ages okay 18 to 55 because we know one of the risk groups is like over 65 or basically the older you are the more prone you are um, to the virus so 
But anyways, 18 to 55. Why? Because phase one, we said we don't want to get those guys or women or whoever that are at high risk because we're just trying this out. Why would we want to risk them if we're not sure about it yet? So we get a lower risk group and we're going to give them um, two vaccinations. They're going to be spaced 28 days apart. And what did they do to these 45? Well, they divided them into three groups. 45 divided by three is 15. So in each group of 15, they gave different dosages because phase one, we've got to figure out the dosage. So we did a 25 uh, microgram. That's not um, milla, that's micro. Microgram, 100 microgram, and 250 microgram dosages. All right. And then, like I said, 15 in each group. Okay, so the basic thing they're saying here about the results is, I mean, pretty common sense because they're saying, okay, well, if we give them more of the vaccine, then they're going to produce like a bigger reaction to it. So how do they judge the reaction is they judge it by this uh, unit here called geometric mean titer. We're looking at antibodies because when you get infected or you get a vaccine, your body pretty much produces uh, these antibodies. Antibodies, you can look at them as well, you could call them soldiers if you want, but I like to look at the cells that make them as soldiers and these antibodies as arrows that they're shooting at because uh, there's these cells, uh, they're called B cells, and B cells become plasma cells and they produce antibodies, and the antibodies are like what help in the immune response. There's lots of other cells that help as well, too, called T cells, but I don't want to get technical. I want you know everyone to kind of understand this, but basically, we're using this as a marker of how much of a defense our body is making, okay? how many weapons or how many soldiers our body is producing. So generally speaking, you could say the higher the better. You get a better uh, response from the body. So you can see here as we go up in the groups from 25 to 100 to 250, we get 40,000, then we get 109,000, then we get 213,000. Then 28 days later, we get the second vaccine. And in those respective groups, okay, so 57 days later, we measure them and we get about 300,000, then about 780,000, and then about like 1.2 million. That sounds great. Obviously, we have to know like, well, what does that mean? What do we have it to compare to? So I'll get to that as we go on. Okay, but obviously we want to know what about side effects? You know, what happened with these side effects? So more than half of them experienced fatigue, chills, headache, myalgia, this is basically muscle weakness, and pain at the injection site. Okay, so... I mean, you could say that about the flu vaccine, but, you know, what, what's the degree of severity? You know, that's, you could say pain for one person is different for another person. All right. Systemic adver um, adverse events. That means something that, you know, happened across the entire body, not just at a local site. Were more common after the second vaccine. Well, most likely if you're going to give somebody a higher dose of something, another drug, you're going to get a worse effect usually. Right. It's a balance. And that's what they're trying to figure out. Like you see here, particularly with the highest dose. And three participants, so three out of the 45, which is 21%, in the highest dosage group, which is the 250, report one or more adverse events. Okay, so we'll take a look at that as well. So what's their conclusion? I mean, they basically said that, you know, we got a immune, immune response and there wasn't anything really concerning. So because of that, you know, let's keep making the vaccine. Okay, now the part that the news probably doesn't report, uh, probably because they don't know how to look into it, or, you know, it's not given to them. So this is what I want to help you guys to piece through and go through and to explain it pretty much in layman terms. Now, I'm not anti-vaccine. I'm not pro-vaccine. I'm just about trying to figure out the science behind the things and making sure we're making an educated decision. That's all. Okay, so let's scroll down here and see what we got. Okay, so this is the background. So they're telling you, okay, we got about 120 candidates for the vaccine that are in development. That started during the first five months of uh, 2020. So, you know, that sounds good. That sounds hopeful. You know, we got 120 pretty much shots on goal. I think Dr. Fauci likes to use that uh, word. And the one that they got here, the mRNA-1273, it's a lipid nanoparticle encapsulated nucleoside modified messenger RNA. What's all that mean? It's basically saying the way we're going to deliver it into the body is we're going to coat it with fat. Okay, it's just a, it's a delivery method. Every company has its own delivery method. Now, the problem here is when we get to the stock market. Now, this is not about the stocks, but what happens is this method is patented, 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 patented. <laughs> I can't say that word. There's a patent on this delivery method. 
okay, L nano lipid nano part LNP. All right. So what happens is they can't do that and make money out of it without basically I don't know doing buying them out, paying a license to a company um, called Arbitus Biopharma. Okay, so this was decided just a couple of days ago, I think July 25th. Okay, so basically the court said there was a patent infringement. Uh, however, it's not going to affect a phase three clinical trial because it's, it's, it's just a trial. They haven't financially gained from it. But when it gets to the point that if this phase three trial proves promising, I'm pretty sure they're going to have to do some financial arrangements with uh, Arbitus, which is uh, ABUS, I believe, in the stock market. But anyways, let's get back to the medical stuff. Okay, so this portion of uh, RNA or mRNA that they are targeting, uh, it's important because it codes, it codes the protein that's on the coat on the outside of the virus that helps the virus attach to these human cells and to enter them and to infect them. As you heard, there are certain areas, and I'm not going to get into it, such as uh, the the ACE uh, enzyme, um, angiotens angiotensin converting enzyme. So that enzyme, um, it's used as a as a receptor site to enter into cells. So again, I don't want to digress, but they're basically trying to prevent the entry of the virus into the human cells. And this protein is uh, an important target for that. So again, here are the methods. I've already pretty much told it to you. They're going to escalate the doses where they have three groups. All right, 25, 100, and 250. We're going to um, give two uh, doses. We're going to give them 28 days apart, and we're going to start measuring them at various days throughout to see how many antibodies these people produce. Something interesting here, which I don't understand entirely, but the participants were not screened to basically see if they have the virus uh, beforehand or not. I say that's interesting because later on in the study, they'll see, you'll see that they removed two people from getting a second dose because those people were isolated because they thought they had um, the disease or not. But then they came back into the study, but they didn't get the vaccine. So that's kind of odd. Uh, anyways, we can discuss it when we get to it. Okay, so the trial procedures. They give half an ml. It was injected into the deltoid muscle, which is your shoulder muscle right up here. And on days one and 29. And then they scheduled follow-up visits, as you can see, seven a week later, two weeks later, and then all these different days later to see how it's going. When they say here they plan for four sentinel participants, that's basically they plan for, let's say, four participants in each group that pretty much would, get, would die or get some serious effects to them. So, you know, they, they basically said that we did it for the two lower groups, 25 and 100, and as long as none of them died or something serious like getting hospitalized happened in eight days, well, you know, then we enrolled some more, all right, four more. So, I mean, I don't know how clinical trials go in general. This is my first time really going in depth into one. But I find it interesting that they only waited eight days to see if any, like, near-death experiences happened before enrolling more into a higher dosage group, okay? So, yeah, two and a half times, right? Because we go from 100 to 250. I don't know what to say. Anyways, uh, we're in a pandemic, so lots of crazy things going on. What else? So here, they start off by telling you also three participants did not receive the second vaccination. So we'll take a look at that why as we go on. Okay, so if you want the name of the protein they're going after, it's called S, which stands for spike-2P. So that's the protein that um, facilitates the binding of the virus into the human cell. So I'm not going to go into all this technical detail. Now, something that they uh, were assessing, it says T-cell responses against the spike protein were assessed by an intracellular cytokine staining assay performed in specimens collected at days, you know, 1, 29, 43. Fuller's report of the interim analysis results were available only for the 25 and the 100 microgram dose groups. Um, I find it interesting that they would not include the 250. They say that that will be available later. Um, but cytokines can get dangerous. Uh, there's things called cytokine, cytokine storms, and that's actually what happens with the virus, and you know it can cause death. And there are actually other companies out there trying to target, uh, you know, let's say treatments that would lower that cytokine uh, storm. Okay, so um, the results of the 45 participants, right? The vaccinations happened between the 16th of March and the 14th of April. As I told you earlier, there were three participants who didn't get the second vaccination. 
And actually, one of them was in the lowest dosage group at 20 micrograms. What happened to that patient pretty much as soon as they got the vaccine less than a week, five days into it? What does it say? They got urticaria on both legs. Let's take a look at what urticaria looks like. Okay, so urticaria is hives. So these are not pictures from the actual, you know, patient. All right, I don't want to say that. All I did is went into Google and put urticaria and legs so you can get an idea. I don't know how severe it was. I didn't see it, but it was severe enough to stop the second dose. And then they say there are two more on top of that who missed a second vaccine. Uh, one also from the lowest dosage group, 25, and one from the highest, the 250, because they missed the second vaccination way owing to isolation for suspected COVID-19. However, ultimately they, were, they turned out negative. Okay, so I read this and it kind of made me think, why were they pending? Why are you going to miss like a big opportunity to post these results, right? And I started thinking, well, how long does it take for the PCR test results to come back? Let's say from a nasal swab or from, you know, a blood test, checking the titer. And I'm like, you can get that stat like right away, especially when you got all this money, you're doing this big study and it's this important. So what did I do just to verify? Okay, I just wanted to look it up and I did a general search and I found out, as you see here, typical, a PCR test takes six hours from start to finish to complete, you know, and you can get your test result back pretty quick. Six hours. PCR, never done it. But, you know, I'm pretty sure you can get it pretty quick if you need to, not to eliminate two people from your study. Regardless, let's move on. Okay, so they say no serious adverse events were noted, right? However, we got to let you know, the one person from the lowest doses group, uh, we had to stop because we basically, you know, didn't expect this to happen. Now, just so you know, I put a note for myself, that's 2.2%. So you can say out of two to three out of every hundred are going to get, you know, hives like this. Okay, so in this part right here, we're taking a look, as you see in the title, it says safety, and we're looking at basically side effects. So after the first vaccine, right, so solicited systemic uh, adverse events, what is that? It's basically side effects that, you know, it's okay if they happen, you know, we expected it, it's pretty common, like, you know, whatever. So basically side effects that they don't think would stop the trial. Okay. So in the lowest dosage group, it was about a third of them that had side effects that they expected anyways. And then as you go up into the middle group, there was about two thirds of them. That's the 100 microgram group. And then ironically, as you were even higher, it was about half of them in the 250 microgram group. All right. So not sure what to say about that, but that's just what happened. And they're saying they were mild or moderate. OK, so they're saying they're not severe. However, remember, there was one of the 25 microgram that stopped and they couldn't continue anymore. Now, in a moment, we'll take a look at these figures of the table so you can get an idea like what are the side effects, what happened, how much and all that. But, you know, common sense, as you probably anticipated and they did as well, too. The second vaccina vaccination produced worse side effects. OK, so as we look at those after the second vaccine, seven out of 13, more than half in the lowest group got these side effects that they expected would happen. And then all of the participants in the 100 microgram group um, got these uh, side effects and all 14 in the 250 um, got these uh, side effects as well, too. Now, look, three of those participants reported one or more severe events. OK, so I put a note here just for myself that this is the most concerning because phase three that's a dosage that they're going at right now. This this Moderna study is a phase three study and the dosage they're using is the 100 microgram group. OK, so basically they're saying that everybody's going to get these side effects. What side effects? Well, we'll take a look at that. One of them, however, is fever. So none of the participants had fever after the first vaccination. OK, that's good. But this phase three trial is requiring two doses of vaccination in order to be effective. So we need to look at the second dose. So after the second dose, no participants in the 25 microgram group. That doesn't matter because phase three has nothing to do with 25. They're going for the 100. Now let's see. But six out of the 15, so 40% in the 100 microgram group, they had fevers. How much? I don't know. And eight, so 57% in the highest group also reported fevers. However, one of these events, the maximum temperature was 39.6 degrees Celsius, which I have here in Fahrenheit, 103.3 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty concerning. However, 
I got to point out it was during the highest dosage group, the 250 microgram group. I didn't get to look at it, but they said you can look at the supplemental index to see what these adverse reactions are. Okay, so here's a chart. What is this chart showing you? Okay, so we have the three groups here, 25 micrograms, 100 micrograms, 250. Again, this is the one that's going after the phase three. Okay, let me outline it. Okay, so this is going to be the phase three trial that they're doing right now. All right, so what are we looking at? Okay. We're basically looking at the days here, from day one to day 57, and what are we measuring? Is we are we are measuring like what are the antibodies pretty much produced during this reaction after they put the vaccine in the person? So what you need to see is the higher number. Let's just think about it simply: the higher number, the better. Let's think about it like that because we're making more antibodies against the virus to fight it. Okay, so obviously you don't want to go too high, but we're not going to get into that right now. But what can we compare it to? Okay, we can look over here at the convalescent serum. What's the convalescent serum? The convalescent serum is basically somebody who got the, the virus naturally, and then they recovered, and then they measured their level of antibodies. Okay, so that's like a natural level of antibodies. That's, I guess you could say it's the ideal level. So that's 142,140. So this is what we're pretty much going for. All right. So in the lowest dosage group, we're here at 116, after one day after the first injection of 25 micrograms. And then here we get 32,000. So we haven't hit yet the 142. Okay, here we haven't hit yet a month after. We give the second dose, and after the second dose, we go up on day 36, and now we're, boom, 391, and they kept measuring all the way to almost 300,000. Okay, now... Um, going over to the next group this is where they're trying to do the phase three trial. What's going on? All right, one day, okay, two days. We're still not at the 142. Now, day 29, we're not there, but we're close. We give another dose. Well, we gave the dose right before that, one day before, and then what happened? Boom, we're at 781. Okay, so then 881, and then you know almost 800,000. So we're you know we're going way after it, but that's the point of these studies. We got to figure out you know how much do we need to make. How long after does it keep going? Things like that. Now with the highest group, um, look at that. We start 178 a day after injection of the first dose. Then 163. Okay, we just went right over it in two weeks after the first injection. Okay, and then they gave the second injection right here, and the day after the second, boom, you know we're at 200, and then we keep going up 1.2, and then we go down, and then we go up. That's kind of interesting to look into. But why did I hi highlight this is because there's a decrease in the title, there's a decrease in the amount. As you see, you go up and then you go down. It's because the body is probably eliminating it. It's too much. They don't want it. There's lots of reasons you can go into it. But, you know, is it going to be there? What's the point I'm trying to make is, okay, after you get this vaccine, how long is your body good for? Like, how, how this is what you would probably put it in, in layman's terms. After I get this vaccine, how long am I good for? How long can I go out in public for? How long can I be around the virus, right? Basically, how long is the defense going to last? How long is this number you know, going to stay over 142, for example? And that's what you got to figure out. And that's what you do with longer and longer trials. But everything is being rushed now, so we don't have that information. We don't even have the information of how many of these people um, actually got infected with covid and how many didn't you know that's that's the importance of trying to do things in steps but again we have a pandemic so you know everything's different uh this is looking at a different thing i'm not going to get into it but it's a basically the same idea over here we have a graph graphical way to look at it again lots of data you can look at here here you have your groups the 25 the 100 the 250 we're looking at different things that we're targeting i'm not going to break it up but basically you get your first vaccine and look your antibodies jump up and then you can see them dropping off again right there, right? Even the 100 jumps up. And it stays kind of stable up there. We're kind of liking that, all right? But again, you got to compare it. You know, is that too high? Is it not too high? All right, we're up at 10 to the 5, things like that. Again, I don't want to get too uh, detailed about that. Let's get back to the paper. Okay, so basically they're saying here the um, S2P whatever. I don't want to say all these words, but... What they're basically saying here is at day 57, it was good enough. At day 57, we exceeded that in the convalescent serum species. Again, that's what I was showing you on the graph. So if we take a look at it at day 57, which would be right here at the end of this, they're saying that all these numbers were higher than somebody who originally got infected with the virus and recovered. It was obviously, you know, it's like it's really high. Okay, so, 
you know, it looks like it produces a response. I mean, but the main question is, there's lots of proteins involved in this. So how do we know that one specific protein is going to help? We don't have that data yet. So still, you know, we're waiting for it. Okay, so we can move past here. And uh, I came across this that shows you some of the side effects and the adverse uh, events that happen. So you got vaccination one, right? And then remember, 28 days later, you have vaccination two. And we're looking at different types of symptoms as we go down here. So any systemic symptom, like anything that pretty much happens in the body, we have our three groups, right? Vaccination one, we have our low, medium, and high dose groups. What does this mean? The gray means that it was a mild response. Um, the blue is moderate, and the orange would be a severe. For example, here, right? The highest dose group after a second vaccine, we have some severe, the other ones we don't. Some of the other symptoms, you know, arthralgia, which would be joint pain. We have fatigue, you know, basically feeling tired. We have fever, which is concerning. Here you got, you know, that severe one in the high group up there. And then I highlighted chills and headache because when I took a look at it, I was trying to I was trying to focus in on the 100 uh, microgram group because that's our phase three that they're going after. So after the first dose, nothing really looks concerning. But after the second one, look how big these are right here, right? And, and this right here, that's uh, over half of the group. So the thing is, like, I don't know, you want to experience, you want half, like, one out of two people going in and they're going to come out with chills and they're going to come out with headache. Again, these are pros and cons that you have to go through because the other thing is, well, do you want COVID infection? You know, do you want the, yeah, do you want the COVID, which is the disease? You know, <laughs> pros and cons. So, like, some, obviously, my, oh, I'd rather take the chills and the headache than, you know, what could happen. So I'm just trying to present to you guys the information. Everybody makes their own choice, you know. I personally don't know where I'm at right now. I'm just trying to make sure we understand the medical and the science uh, behind this here. So a bunch of charts, a bunch of graphs over here. And feel free, by the way, to put in the comments uh, any questions or concerns you have at this point. Anything you want me to address, uh, just let me know. So the discussion is basically their way of wrapping this up and saying, okay, well, what does this whole thing mean? You know, where are we going to go from this? Okay, so this is the part where you basically need to brag and say why this was important. It's also your chance to kind of, you know, scientifically cover up, you know, what went wrong and, you know, try to offer an explanation uh, for what could be done. Okay, so here's the bragging part. And it's fine because, you know, it's good. They did it. They deployed um, a first inhuman clinical vaccine candidate in record time. So what are they saying? Normally it requires years. We did it in two months. Okay, that is awesome. But... You know why it requires rears? Because we want to see if it works. We got to let it go out there for a while. We got to see, do these people get sick? Do they not get sick? Um, how serious of events do they have in the future? You know, all these things, that's why. But because this is like getting pushed because of it's a pandemic, you know, they did it in two months. So good and bad to say about that, but that's fine. Let's move forward. All right, so they said that, you know, the vaccine um, was created really recently after the whole genome was posted uh, back on the 10th of January, the genome basically is the map, you know, that tells you, you know, what are, what's the blueprint to this uh, virus and, you know, what can we look at, what can we target, such as here they targeted the S2P uh, spike protein that helps the virus enter into the cells. Okay, so down here they're saying, okay, well, you know, the two vaccine generally, there wasn't anything serious, but remember, there was a person that got hives all over their legs and they had to stop. There were also the two people that didn't make the window, supposedly. There was also the fever that was over 103 degrees Fahrenheit. So there, there still are some concerning things, all these things with only 45 people. But again, remember, the hives was at the lowest dose group. The fever was at the, high, at the highest at 250. Okay, so still kind of concerning things there. But they go ahead and quote um, their own, actually, research, if I understand it correctly, uh, against other vaccine trials that they did for, the, for basically for the flu. So they're basically comparing these results to results that they had for the flu uh, vaccine that they made earlier. Okay, and they say basically, you know, the more you give somebody, the worse side effects you're going to get. Okay, well, we understand that one. Okay, let's move on down and let's see what else that we got down here. Okay, so this is the part that I was talking about, right? They can't say, well, you know, is this working? How good is this? You know, did it actually stop people from getting sick? They don't have it. So what can they compare? You got to always compare the closest thing you have. And they compared research done on monkeys. And I love animals, so I'm not really cool with this. But what's the rhesus? Uh, I don't know how to say it, you guys. Rhesus ma macaquis? Macaquis? I don't know. Let's see what they look like. Aw, uh, 
these guys are cute. I'm sure some of you are saying, oh, man, that's ugly. But whatever, <laughs> you know, personal opinion. So I just looked them up to see what they look like. Uh, I saw this picture, and then I saw the article. I clicked on it, and it says, Six monkeys given an experimental coronavirus vaccine from Oxford did not catch COVID-19 after heavy exposure raising hopes for a human vaccine. Aw, they injected these poor little guys with the virus. All right, well, I don't know. I'm not going to talk about testing on animals right now. But uh, basically, this uh, Oxford, it's a university, and they're uh, partnered up with uh, a company called AstraZeneca, uh, working on the vaccine as well, too. Okay, so it says six monkeys received a vaccine um, produced by Oxford, I believe, in the UK. And then they exposed them to the virus. And they said these monkeys suffered no ill effects, however, and remained healthy at least 20 days later. All right. Lots of things missing there, but let's not get into that. Okay, so they call that a SARS-CoV-2 challenge. Challenge means we're basically going to give you the virus and see what happens. We're going to challenge you. And then there's a re-challenge. They just they give them the vaccine. They gave them the virus again. Okay, what are, what's next here? Okay, they said, um, well, you know, we stopped at 57 days, but you know, we don't know, you know, how long is this immune response is going to last. So we're going to at least follow them for another year. You know, so that's interesting because obviously you'd want to wait for that year before you begin the next phase. But being in a pandemic, they're starting phase two at the same time they're starting phase three. So, you know, I don't know what to say. We are in a pandemic. So it's kind of like you don't follow the same procedures. You might get good. You might get bad. But again, everybody should be educated. That's my job, I believe, as a medical doctor to make sure uh, people whether patients or anybody, or have totally complete informed decisions. Okay, now going up here, uh, we talked about the lipid nanoparticle. Uh, once they get to trying to make money on that, I don't know if you guys heard the CEO talk about it on Yahoo. You know, he said, we're going to charge money, obviously, but, um, you know, we've invested, I think, I don't know if it was $2 billion. I don't know, I have to go back and look. I know they got at least about a billion in funding almost. And um, so they got to make that money back. It's a business, you know. Obviously, they want to try to help out. But it's a business and, you know, a lot of shareholders can't lose all that money. So they're going to charge. And um, but in order to do that, they're going to have to do something with uh, Arbitus. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Yeah, with Arbitus Biopharma, because right now they're infringing the patent of delivering the vaccine through this lipid nanoparticle delivery method. OK, so let's continue down here. What do we got here? OK, so this is another warning right here, right? So it says previous experience with veterinary coronavirus vaccines and animal models of blah, 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 have raised safety concerns about the potential for vaccine associated enhancement. OK, they're basically saying that the vaccine um, can cause uh, enhanced respiratory disease. OK, so they want to try to prevent that. So they were comparing it to other previous. Uh, this is Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome coronavirus, which was, uh, I don't know, years ago. Obviously not as big or else we would have remembered it. But sometimes it can cause like a respiratory disease. So they need to evaluate it. They talk about it and they say like all these different responses that can cause like, you know, here you have the TH2. But they're basically saying you want more of a TH1 bias T cell response for it to be better. And, um, you know, trying to give credit to what they're doing. They're saying it's important to note that Basically, their vaccine also induces the Th1, which is the good, which is what they're saying is the good uh, CD4 T cell response in humans, which would basically keep you um, or help prevent you from having uh, this enhanced respiratory disease from the vaccine. And in order to make sure, they're going to test more on animals and uh, continue to monitor it on humans. Okay, so here it is. They said of the three dose profiles, they're going with 100 microgram dose because why it elicits high neutralization responses that basically means it prevents um the virus from entering into the human cell and replicating and going on to infect uh, more cells and the th1 skewed cd4 t cell response which helps to prevent against adverse side effects like this respiratory uh, respiratory disease and a bunch of other things whatever basically they're saying the hundred showed to be the best in terms of lower side effects and working the best in terms of helping to produce antibodies. So, you know, they're saying phase two is going to have 600 uh, healthy adults. 
um, evaluating doses of the 50 and the 100, but then the phase three is evaluating just the 100. So we don't even have the data on phase two, okay? I mean, obviously they have it because they're doing the research, but you know, we don't, it, it's not like if this was a virus that was not a pandemic, yeah, you would have to wait years and you'd have to test it out and you'd have to see uh, that it works. Okay, so basically what I'm saying here is, you know, number one, I'm not trying to bash on Moderna. Like what they did and they accomplished was a lot and they invested a lot of time, a lot of money and everything. What I'm trying to do here is show you the things that you're not hearing about so you can make informed decisions. I'm not for this vaccine. I'm not against this vaccine. I honestly don't have enough information to make an informed decision for myself. So let's wait and see what's going to come out. Um, you know, hoping for the best. If you you know you know any other questions or any comments or any things, if you feel like I did not mention something properly, you know, write it in the comments below. If you want me to address something, okay. You could also go to my website again, slash covid nineteen, and uh, I'll put in the link in the description below. And I'm working on this editing it, but um, for example, I'll have this video here linked uh, to go to it. Uh, what do you know about COVID-19? You can click on it here and uh, it will take you to this form. Uh, you can choose some topics people have told me. You can click here. You can enter in uh, your own topic. And I'll take a look, see what people vote on. And uh, from there, I'll make uh, the next video. So I hope you guys stay safe. If you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe, share with others. Uh, write for me what you want me to talk about next time. And talk to you guys later. Take care.